With the launch of a new console always comes new IPs and potential franchises looking to set an early standard that games coming out later have to achieve, if not overcome in an effort to become memorable. Most of these launch games showcase the impressive technology behind the latest gaming console while not necessarily revolutionizing the gaming landscape by having a gameplay style rooted in the generation prior or even earlier. The counterplay games develop Godfall attempts to change the perception of what a console launch game can be by presenting a first of its kind looter slasher with the player's intent of slicing their way through hordes of enemies and achieving weapons and accessories galore. I was intrigued to see if this Gearbox published adventure could break the console launch title curse or just become another forgettable piece of software. After the falling out between two brothers, Orin and Macros, that results in Orin nearly being slain and left for dead, the player controls the warrior looking to stop his kin from attaining godhood. To do this, the player must take Orin through three semi-open world environments, cutting down enemies, collecting various forms of loot, including upgradable weapons, and leveling up Orin's overall stats, so he can overcome the next stage depending on whatever character level is recommended. After spending a little over 12 hours in this sci-fi medieval world, I conquered the final boss on normal difficulty while periodically bumping up the difficulty for an extra challenge. With a grind heavy trophy list, including simple things like smiting a certain number of enemies to completing the incredibly tough Dreamstones in-game offering, I could take up arms and continue playing, but the motivation is definitely lacking for yours truly after spending as much time as I did with Godfall already. Though it has nothing to do with the highly acclaimed God of War from 2018, Godfall definitely takes a lot of its gameplay from the PS4 exclusive with the added premise of loot that can help Orin survive waves of enemies that litter every stage. As expected, the base attacks in Orin's repertoire include light though weaker strikes and heavy yet slower maneuvers, with the player being able to charge the heavy attacks. While weak and strong strikes aren't new in any way, shape, or form, the implementation of Soul Shatter is. Soul Shatter sees the player using light attacks to essentially stack up potential damage that can be realized when Orin unleashes a heavy strike, usually completely depleting a non-boss's health bar. On the opposite end of the Soul Shatter spectrum is Breach. Under every adversary's health is another bar that fills up when that enemy is hit with heavy attacks. Once that bar fills up, that enemy is breached and vulnerable to a takedown, a maneuver that can be utilized on a stunned opponent for a possible one-hit kill. Both implementations make great use of the DualSense controller's haptic feedback triggers, as the player can feel the pressure building up in the R2 trigger before pressing it down for that devastating heavy attack. Every enemy has a weakness that is learned once defeated, a fact that gives way to the polarity system that sees Orn unleash a wave of energy when switching from one of the two melee weapons currently equipped to the other, after the first item's bar, as seen via the weapon's icon, is filled. There are bars that also fill up above the weapon's icons, upon landing strikes that will allow Orn to activate weapon class specific special attacks that are unlocked via the game's skill tree. The last two bars associated with Orin has to do with his protective shield and his Archon Fury. Orin's shield not only allows for him to block incoming attacks, but if the player times the block shortly before Orin is struck, the protagonist will parry said attack to counter with one of his own. Though some attacks can't be blocked, enemies turn red when they are about to utilize said unblockable maneuver. The shield too can be used as a weapon via the skill tree upgrades that allow for moments such as Orin tossing it so it wraps around an arena to hit multiple foes while absorbing health. Archon Fury is essentially Orin's ultimate maneuver that, when activated, allows for Orin to become invincible while being assisted by whatever is associated with said armor that is currently equipped. Archon Fury attacks can range from laser firing pillars appearing from the ground to ghost warriors fighting alongside Orin. The combat does have its flaws, with the most glaring being the action cue. All button inputs are cued, meaning there is a great lack of canceling attacks in Godfall, 
This queuing of attacks can be incredibly detrimental, especially if an adversary is preparing an unblockable attack and the player wants to dodge, but since Orin is still in mid animation and has another strike queued, Orin will be struck by the enemy no matter if the player hits the dodge button at the proper time. Another issue is targeting. While there are manual and automatic targeting systems, both are the most effective when facing large groups of enemies. Manual targeting will leave Orin susceptible to back attacks before the player can recognize the flashing red incoming indicator located underneath the protagonist. Auto-targeting may have Orin slashing in the direction of someone the player isn't aiming for or just striking air in general. The AI is incredibly inconsistent as well, working strong as a unit one moment before settling down and waiting to be struck down the next. Certain enemies, usually spellcasters and healers, will continuously back up or teleport across the battlefield, proving incredibly annoying if a player doesn't want to waste special attack bars or doesn't have a pole weapon equipped. Though there is a lot associated with the fighting in Godfall, nothing matters more than the loot. As the player overcomes enemies, unlocks chests, and simply plays through the story, Orin is gifted copious amounts of items to equip. Beyond the obvious weapons that are grouped in one of five classes featuring swords, hammers, daggers, and poles, are various trinkets and amulets that can do anything from boosting Orin's overall health to helping in increasing the chance for inflicting status ailments like Ignite or Bleed. Each weapon class has its own playstyle, such as daggers featuring shorter range and less damage, but can hit an enemy faster than an incredibly powerful, yet woefully slow warhammer ever could. All the equipable items can be upgraded via various materials and currency rewarded by fallen enemies and completed missions. Unfortunately for gamers who get used to a certain weapon or amulet that does them well for a mission or two and decide that they want to upgrade said item, we'll find that the game will toss newer, even better weapons and items that makes the work and upgrading items seem counterproductive. That counterproductive feeling also goes hand in hand with one of the game's biggest draws, Valor Plates. Full body armor that must be crafted using mission earned currency. Like the non-weapon items that can be equipped, Valor Plates can also help in inflicting ailments and give Orange's stats boost. Valor Plates also provide extra Archon Fury possibilities as well as another system known as Augments, where another set of items can be slotted in the Valor Plates menu for, once again, boosts and buffs for putting ailments on enemies and adding to Orin's chances of survival. Most enemies are prone to specific elements like fire-based enemies taking more damage if Orin is equipped with a water-based weapon. Valor Plates also have elemental or status ailment properties, allowing for Orn to be more effective in battle if the equipped Valor Plate is the opposite of whatever the world and its enemies represent. Sadly, Valor Plates can only be changed in the game's main hub, the Sanctuary, even though weapons and equipable items can be switched at any time. Another interesting fact is every Valor Plate is gender specific. With Orin actually having a feminine voice and body when equipping, say, the Phoenix Valor Plate. The narrative is anything but memorable. Beyond the opening sequence that prepares for an inevitable family war, Orin simply talks to two characters in the sanctuary about how perilous their current situation is regarding Macros before being told it's time to move on to the next story mission. Unfortunately, the missions are just as uninspired as the story, with a majority usually seeing Orin go around one of the three worlds, Earth, Water, and Wind, hacking up enemies, lighting beacons, and overcoming a mid-boss that has more health and abilities than the average adversaries, but aren't presented in the same light as the main story sub-bosses or macros as generals. Upon completing each mission, the player can take part in continuing their exploration of the world they currently occupy, discovering locked chests and the like that can be rather fruitful. The biggest mission structure issue is the game temporarily locking the story by forcing the player to backtrack through these somewhat small worlds, to redo missions in an effort to attain sigils that, when collected in a sum of 10, can allow the player to continue the story. The problem usually occurs right before a sub-boss battle and really hurts the general flow and excitement of seeing what's next. 
After the story is completed, players can take part in the Dreamstone missions. These in-game objectives are boosted, tougher versions of what was seen during the main story, but with an added caveat of the player being gifted boost and information in preparation for the boss, they must be conquered during the third of three Dreamstone specific missions. Dreamstone missions are made for the hardest of hardcore Godfall players, and will test one's mettle more than any other objectives during the story. One mission that differentiates itself from any other in the story is the Trial Missions, where Orin must defeat enemies while ascending a mechanized tower. These trial sequences tie into the other in-game offering, the Ascent Tower of Trials. An unlimited tower of enemies that, when each level is completed, provides keys that can unlock the game's most powerful weapons. Both are a nice way to keep players coming back if they enjoy the gameplay over anything else. Technically, the game is gorgeous to look at with the initial presentation of shiny gold architecture reflecting the fiery battles that is occurring before each illuminating pillar. The earth and water worlds, though, leave something to be desired from an aesthetic perspective, especially compared to the Wind Realm. This game is a great early example of what people can look forward to coming into gaming's ninth generation. There were no hard crashes, but the game did suffer from frame rate drops from time to time due to one of the game's biggest negatives against it. It is always online. Though Godfall features a three-player co-op ability where players can invite up to two friends to join them in battle, there is no matchmaking unfortunately. The game will not allow players to be offline even if they're playing alone. Though players can't adjust their network settings to prevent invites. Godfall uses the gameplay from other enjoyable third-person hack and slashers to provide a mostly enjoyable fighting experience, but the underwhelming story, unnecessary loot upgrades, and the lack of matchmaking to play with others instead of relying solely on friends makes Godfall less of an ascension to glory and more a fall from potential grace. Godfall isn't a bad or terrible game, just a mediocre offering. The combat is solid, but mostly unremarkable. The storytelling is lacking, even if the lore appears fantastic and could have helped produce a tremendous plot. The missions and various enemies rarely leave a lasting impression after the first hour or so, including the final boss. Like so many launch titles in the past, Godfall doesn't set the world on fire, but is a fine experience that is worth checking out when it's at a very cheap price or offered as a free PlayStation Plus game in the future. But if this sounds like a must buy right now, prepare for Orn to get knocked on his butt a lot before he snaps the neck of an annoying sorcerer who won't stay still. <laughs> 